guys, my name's Casey and we are back with Study in Australia TV. Today we're going to learn about ocean life. Now I'm sure a lot of you are keen to head to the beach while you're in Australia. A nice relaxing trip with friends, cooling off in the water on a hot Aussie summer's day. It sounds pretty inviting. But before you go, let's just take a look at some of the fascinating animals that call Australian waters home. Leafy sea dragon. There are three known species of sea dragon. The leafy, weedy and recently discovered ruby but today we're going to focus on the leafy sea dragon. Affectionately known as leafies, many people don't realise that they're actually a species of fish, closely related to the seahorse or the pipefish. Their long, delicate leafy flaps of skin make them perfectly adapt to hiding in kelp and seaweed. These leafy appendages are useless for movement, so they must rely on their dorsal fin, found on their backs, as well as their pectoral fins, which are found behind their head. They look roughly like an ear. They are exclusively found in the waters of South and East Australia. They feed on plankton, small crustaceans and even other fish, but only juvenile fish that are small enough to eat, or their eggs. The way they consume and digest food is very interesting. They have no teeth or stomach, so they must almost constantly eat throughout the day. They suck in their food whole through their snout. They also have interesting breeding adaptations. Like seahorses, the male sea dragons are the ones who carry the eggs, but they don't have a pouch. Instead, they have a spongy brood patch on the outside of their tails. The females deposit their eggs on this patch and the males fertilize the egg and the skin hardens around the eggs, securing them in place and providing them with a source of oxygen. Around 250 to 300 bright pink eggs will remain attached to their father for approximately 100 days until they hatch. They have quite small territories, usually no larger than 10 square meters. They stay within their territories because although their appearance is perfectly adapted for camouflage, in the open water they would stand out, particularly to humans who often seek to take them home as pets. This is in fact the biggest risk to their survival. In the early 90s, so many of them were taken as pets that their numbers became critically low. The Australian government had to place a complete protection on them. Other threats include pollution and habitat loss. Manta ray. Perhaps surprisingly, manta rays are classified as fish, just like the sea dragons. Their name comes from the Spanish word manta, meaning blanket, coat, or shawl, referring to their unique flat diamond-like shape bodies. They are sometimes known as devilfish due to the horn-shaped fin on their heads. They are highly intelligent and possess the largest brain to size ratio of any ectothermic fish and research indicates that they have highly developed and long-term memory. Until recently, it was believed that there was only one extant species of manta ray. Then, in 2008, the DNA testing revealed that there is in fact two distinct species, the larger giant oceanic manta ray and the smaller reef manta ray. The giant oceanic manta ray spends most of its time away from land and can be found across all of the major oceans. They can grow up to 8 metres from tip of one wing to the other and weigh 1,500 kilo. They have a widespread distribution and are found worldwide in tropical and temperate waters. The reef manta ray is found in the Indo-Pacific and tropical East Atlantic Ocean and is primarily in coastal regions, staying within the proximity of coasts, reefs and islands. They can grow up to 5 metres but are usually between 3 and 3.5 three and metres from wingtip to wingtip. They take around 10 years to reach sexual maturity, but that's all right as they live up to 50 years. The female is pregnant for 12 to 13 months, then gives birth to just one or occasionally two offspring. The babies are born self-sufficient and can survive without their parents. They are filter feeders, meaning that they swim with their large mouths wide open, sifting food through their tiny gill plates, which line their mouths. They feed on plankton, as well as small fish and squid. Fun fact, a group of manta rays is called a squadron. They are very difficult to keep alive in captivity. Only a few aquariums have managed it. Often, when held in captivity, they will refuse to eat and eventually die. Both species are classified as vulnerable. This is largely due to overfishing and further hindered by their slow rates of maturation and reproduction. Grey nurse shark. There are many species of shark that thrive in Australian waters. More than 50 species live in the coral sea of the coast of Queensland alone. But don't worry, not all sharks are scary. 
This particular shark is the grey nurse shark, but sometimes goes by the name of sand tiger shark. It may look ferocious, and fairly recently it was to believe to be. It had a very fearful reputation. However, this was unwarranted. Researchers found that this is the only a threat to humans if provoked. They are grey and greyish brown in colour, with a much lighter underbelly, and can grow up to 3 metres long, with the largest recorded at 3.2 metres. They have small eyes and long mouths, full of long, sharp teeth. They live in relatively close proximity to land, such as tropical reefs, coastal waters, estuaries and shallow bays. They live in all of Australian waters except for Tasmania, but are also found in other parts of the world, such as the USA, South Africa and Argentina. They prefer subtropical to cool temperate waters. Their diet is made up of fish, including other sharks, squids and crustaceans. They are slow moving and do most of their hunting on the ocean floor. Due to their previous reputation, they were hunted for a time. As a result, their numbers have reduced and they are now protected by Queensland and New South Wales law. Males reach sexual maturity at four to six years of age and females at six to eight years. The females usually give birth to two one meter long, fully independent pups or occasionally just one. They are oviparous, meaning they hatch from within the eggs while still inside their mother. They display intrauterine cannibalism, where the young pups will eat their less developed siblings while still in the womb, as well as unfertilized eggs. They have one of the lowest reproductive rates of any shark, as they only give birth every two to three years. They are classified as vulnerable. Blue ringed octopus. The blue ringed octopus is a name collectively given to a group of four highly venomous species of octopus. We're going to talk about the greater blue ringed octopus today. They're not exclusive to Australian waters and can be found anywhere in the Pacific Ocean from here to Japan. Despite their name, they're actually quite small, about the size of a golf ball. Like most octopuses, they have the ability to change their skin colour to camouflage with their surroundings. The blue ring in their name refers to the 60 or so circular shaped rings that cover their bodies. When threatened, these rings will flash bright blue warning potential predators of the octopus's toxicity. They produce a paralyzing neurotoxin which is released through their salivary glands. Luckily, they are not as aggress an aggressive species and will generally only bite a human if they are picked up or stepped on. So, no matter how cute or innocent they might look, if you do come across one in a rock pool, do not touch it. Their venom is generally used for hunting prey they pierce the exoskeleton or scales of crustaceans and small fish with their beak, inserting the venom. They then consume the helpless paralyzed prey. Cone shells. Our next ocean creature isn't actually that distantly related to the blue ringed octopus, as they are all part of the phylum, a taxonomic group or group of animals called mollusks. Cone shells refers to approximately 500 different species of predatory sea snails distributed throughout the Pacific and Indian Oceans. You can find many of these in the waters surrounding the northern half of Australia, with 133 living in the waters of the Great Barrier Reef. National Geographic describes them as an underwater tank. As the name suggests, these snails have cone-shaped shells, which are brightly coloured or patterned. Some people see these pretty shells and think it's a good idea to take them home. Don't, it's not. They possess a specialized tube known as a proboscis, which they use to shoot their tiny harpoons, coated in venom into their victims. They have over 500 different components to their venom, which they mix in different combinations depending on what they need it for. For example, in defense against a predator or for paralyzing their own prey. While there is no anti-venom available, the last reported human death in Australia resulting from a cone shell sting was in 1935. Symptoms often include intense pain, numbness or tingling, and in extreme cases, double vision, fainting and respiratory paralysis. Remember, if it's a cone, leave it alone. Australian box jellyfish. There are over 50 species of box jellyfish, but the largest is the Australian box jellyfish. Their name comes from the distinctive cube shape that they possess in their medusa or adult stage of life. They have 60 tentacles, each equipped with millions of stinging cells known as nematocysts. These are tiny harpoons 
attached to a bulb filled with venom that attacks the heart, nervous system and skin cells. They can grow to 38 centimetres wide across the bell and the tentacles can extend to up to 3 metres. They are found in northern Australian waters around the top three states, specifically north of Bundaberg, Queensland and Exmouth, Western Australia. Australian box jellyfish are often considered to be the most venomous marine animal. Their tentacles leave whip-like marks, which they may lead to significant scarring and victims may experience strong pain for weeks after a run-in with these jellyfish. Again, it's not as bad as it sounds. There's only a death in Australia every three to four years from a box jellyfish sting. But other countries such as the Philippines have reported between 20 to 50, so you still need to be careful. Safety. If you do decide to head to the beach, there are a couple of rules to follow to keep you as safe as possible. Look out for the red and yellow flags and always swim between them. These are set up to help you avoid dangerous currents, known as rips in addition to dangerous animals or other risks. And if you do get in trouble, swimming at a beach with lifeguards or lifesavers means that they can aid you if you need it. Be sure to read any and all of the safety signs. Never swim at night alone after drinking or at an unpatrolled beach. If you do get in trouble, stick your hand up in the air and call for help. For further information on beach and water safety, as well as general information, visit studyinaustralia.tv. As a bonus tip, remember that the sun in Australia can be quite harsh, especially in the summer months. So be sure to use SPF 50 plus sunscreen and wear appropriate protection, such as a hat, sunglasses, and long sleeve shirt. You might be surprised about how quickly you can get sunburn. Also, be sure to bring plenty of water and stay hydrated. Thank you so much for joining me today. As always, it has been a pleasure. Now, if you do want any more information, remember to head to the website studyinaustralia.tv. We'll see you on the next episode. Bye for now.